Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to our audience. Um, there are more than 170 people registered for this webinar. I welcome you all from all over the world to participate with us in this important conversation. And I thank you to be there. My name is Mo Blaker. I'm the chair of GAMAC, the Global um, Action Against Mass Atrocity Crime, a prevention platform who is supporting Costa Rica, Denmark, and the Global Center on R2P, um, all members of GAMAC steering group in organizing this event. I'm very pleased to welcome you on this webinar on promoting human rights mechanism to prevent mass atrocities, reflection, challenges, and ways forward. For those who are not very familiar with GAMAC, the prevention platform GAMAC is a global state-led initiative composed by states, civil society, and academic institutions engaged to prevent atrocities by establishing national prevention architecture and policies. Today's panel will explore good practices and experiences from national human rights commissions and mechanism in strengthening the national capacity to prevent the commission of or the recurrence of mass atrocities. As uh, recently highlighted by the Human Rights Council resolution called the contribution of the Human Rights Council to the prevention of human rights violations, national human rights institutions play indeed a very, very important role in prevention, among others, by ensuring factual information about the respect of human rights on the ground and also by providing early information about warning signals and patterns of human rights violations. The resolution passed very recently in the Human Rights Council recognizes also that states have the primary responsibility for the promotion and protection of all human rights, including the prevention of human rights violation. In other words, and it's not a total, and it's not a coincidence, we totally coincide this resolution states that prevention begins at home, that is in each of our countries. Each of us is responsible to prevent these human rights violations. This year also commemorates the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action and the 20th anniversary of the adoption by the United Nations uh, of the Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security. This is a very important milestone for all of us. And the COVID-19 pandemic has shown indeed that crises affect mostly women and girls disproportionately, and that today's virtual panel will also highlight good practices in terms of the prevention of discrimination based on gender and sexual orientation. I'm also very, very pleased and touched to have extraordinary distinguished panelists. And at first, what I would like to say is welcome. Welcome to all of you. But also I'm extremely pleased because we have here Nana Kruza, who is representing a national human rights institution in, in Denmark. And I'm so much looking forward to hear you. Uh, we have um, most professor reverend uh, Emmanuel Asante, a distinguished clergyman and scholar who served until very recently as chairman of the Ghana National Peace Council. And he is also the former presiding bishop of the Methodist Church Ghana, and you will be able in a good position to tell us uh, not only about the role of, um, of um, the Peace Council, but also about the role of the church. Uh, furthermore, I'm welcoming also Mr. Victor Madrigal Borlo, who is actually a senior visiting researcher at the Howard Law School of Human Rights program, and he is the UN independent expert on protection against violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. But you also have been the, um, the head of the registry of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, and you are particularly very well versed in, um, in rehabilitation for torture victim. So welcome to you. And last but not least at all, Savita Pandawe, uh, is the deputy executive director of the important global center for the responsibility to protect 
and she oversees the Global Center Program in New York and Geneva. Savita leads the development of innovative institutional mechanisms and capacities to prevent mass atrocities, both at national and international level. Um, let me first turn to um, Nana Margarete Cruza. You are the senior consultant at the Danish Institute for Human Rights and also the team leader, I will try to say it in the right way, that works with protection of discrimination and promotion of equal treatment on the grounds of racial and ethnic origin, according to the Article 13 in the Race Directive. You also specialized in equal treatment and anti-discrimination and access to rights. Um, so I think um, I'm very happy that you can begin uh, this conversation, Nana. Um, I, I'm sure that our audience will be very interested to understand a little bit better what is the role of your center in particular, what are the main approaches of the Institute in the promotion of equal treatment for all. And I think that knowing a little bit our audience out there, it will be very good in particular uh, to share your good practices and, and lessons learned. So Nana, welcome and you have the floor, thank you. You just have to unmute yourself. Can yeah, you hear me you. now? Good, perfect. Thank you so much um, for the invitation. And I am very honored to be um, in such fine company. However, on such an important issue. Um, I will talk briefly about hate crimes in Denmark and touch upon how we, the Danish Institute for Human Rights, work with this area. We are the National Human Rights Institution um, and our mandate is to promote and protect human rights. We are also a national equality body in relation to race and ethnicity, gender, uh, following the EU directives, as Mo uh, has explained. This means that we work to promote equal treatment of all persons without discrimination. And finally, we have a special role uh, within the disability area. Um, so our mandates are strong and connect us both to international human rights law and EU law, which is a very strong field um, in the field of equality. And these joint mandates actually give us a unique platform to join the fight against hate crimes. So I think it's important to have that in mind that we actually have different mandates that work very well together. And as I'm sure you know, uh, hate crimes comes in many different types and shapes. And we see hate crime in a Danish context uh, as the severest form of discrimination. Hate crime can be different types of crimes, for instance, violence, threats, vandalism, etc. And I will try and be very concrete when we talk about hate crimes, because a hate crime in Denmark might be something different than a hate crime in, um, in Ghana or somewhere, some other country. So I'll give you an example. This is a case from a real life. Hanan, she is 25 years old and wearing a niqab. She's with a friend when an ethnic Danish woman comes over and speaks aggressively to them. The woman says, that's the kind of people we should burn. We need to burn them, their clothes, their families. Hanan and her friend ask the woman to stop. Then the woman grabs Hanan around her neck and Hanan pushes her away. This is from real life. Another example, a woman is waiting for the bus with her eight month old daughter in a baby stroller. A group of three young women, uh, three ethnic minority, um, who has an ethnic minority are standing at the bus stop. They have seen the star of David around her neck, as well as a small batch on the stroller with Hebrew writing. The men surround the baby stroller and spit into it. This is also a hate crime in Denmark. These are severe crimes, but unfortunately we have also seen the severest of hate crimes where the hate towards a specific group ends in killings. An example, in 2015, Copenhagen was struck by a terror attack. There were three separate shootings involving the same perpetrator. Two victims died while five police officers were wounded. The first shooting took place at a small public afternoon event concerned art, 
blasphemy and freedom of expression, where an armed gunman killed one civilian and wounded three police officers. The reason why the gunmen attacked this place was because they were talking about freedom of speech. Um, and there was an artist there who had actually drawn um, the prophet of Muhammad, and he didn't like that. It's a famous Swedish artist. The second shooting by the same gunman at the same day took place outside a synagogue in Copenhagen. Here, the gunman killed a young Jewish man on security during, during a bat mitzvah celebration and wounded two police officers. Later that morning, this perpetrator was killed. This could have ended much worse if the gunman had, for instance, been able to enter the synagogue, but luckily it didn't. But this is just to show the different spectres of a hate crime that goes from more ordinary violence to the worst kind of violence. And we have to keep in mind that a hate crime is always categorized where it is motivated by hate to, for instance, a person's race, skin color, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation. Okay, so how many hate crimes do we actually have in Denmark? In Denmark, it's the National Police who publishes a yearly report on the number of registered hate crimes in Denmark. And in 2019, that's last year, the police had registered 569 cases. And the majority of these were racially motivated. Next in line are the ones that are religiously motivated, mainly towards Muslims. And I'm guessing this might be the same picture that we see in many states, in many countries, that it's either uh, race or religion um, that is at play when we talk about hate crime. Um, and then of course, we also have hate crimes um, because of sexual orientation. However, this number, the 500 and something, there is a huge hidden figure or dark number that we don't see. Meaning that there are of course more than 500 something hate crimes a year in Denmark. And even the police acknowledges this and writes it specifically in their report. So this is actually, I think, one of the good lessons learned that by working with the police, they also acknowledge that, of course, they cannot register all hate crimes. There are things they don't see for many different reasons. Um, but the fact that they, over the last couple of years, now have acknowledged this huge hidden number or dark figure is actually um, a good thing. And the reason I can say this with such a conviction that there is such a, a dark figure is that the Ministry of Justice annually looks into what um, victims of violence think is the motivation for the crime. Do they think they have been um, exposed to a crime because of racism, for instance? And these numbers translate into among, I don't know, 4,000 people a year. That is quite a different number than what we see from the police. And I think this is an important um, message to take away that the official number is of course not the correct number. So how do we in Denmark uh, at the Danes Institute for Human Rights work with this area? Everything we do is minded at creating change. Change for the better, for the persons or groups that we are fighting or to get better and more effective protection prevention against hate crimes. And if I had slides, I would show you a picture of a bulldog. Usually we see like watchdogs because this is what human rights, national human rights institutions are, we are a watchdog. But I like the fact that we are a bulldog. So I'm trying to give you this image of us being a bulldog um, that do not let go until we get a change for the better. But it takes a long time and there are no easy fixes. We have been working with this area for more than a decade. We have made reports on hate crimes and its consequences, both for society and for the persons, the individuals themselves. We have published recommendations directed towards authorities, such as the police, the ministries, etc. Um, we meet with ministers, we meet with government officials, and every opportunity we get every opportunity we see, we lobby for these recommendations. We have made campaigns directed at the public. 
We have in, been involved in educating the police. We constantly participate in public debate and we report to the UN system, of course. We hold roundtable meetings with civil society and the police trying to bridge the gap between them because that is one of the how do you say challenges that we see is that the people who experience hate crimes they don't go to the police we did a whole report on hate crimes where none of them had been reported to the police we showed it to the police who said all of these are hate crimes but people don't go to the police with them mainly because they don't feel they're being taken seriously or that it matters in the end. So there are many different issues at stake here. Um, so we do, I think it's important to know that we work on many different fronts in order to get change for the better. Dialogue is extremely important. Keep pushing, keep having dialogues, keep being out there so that the groups that we're working for can see that we're actually fighting the fight to combat hate crimes. And things have changed and have progressed, but there's still a long way to go. So we will continue to be the bulldog. And I think that almost brings me in at my 10 minutes. And so thank you so much for your time and for your ears. And please, if you have any questions later on about how we do, how we work more specifically with the area, um, just, yeah, bring them on or you can catch me tomorrow. But thank you so much. Anna Krusa, thank you so much, not only for what you said, but also for the energy you are bringing in. And uh, I love the idea that you call yourself uh, a bulldog. I just think it's important. Just one question before we pass to, uh, to Reverend Santa. Who created your institution? What status has your institution? Yes, but that's a good thing or the interesting thing about our mandate. We are a national human rights institution based on the UN Paris principles. We are a Very state good. organization, but independent from the state. But then we also have the specific mandate as an equality body given by the EU. And the EU is extremely, um, how do you say, strong and powerful when it comes to equal treatment. So I think the fact that we have a very specific mandate, all EU member states have to have equality bodies. So the government can't say, well, we don't want this or something. They have to have it. Otherwise, they're in violation of EU directive. And it's a combination of being equality body and a national human rights organization that works really good. Excellent. So you are bulldog with teeth. That's yes. what I understand. And yes. That's really good. Uh, and uh, your state took responsibility also to create that while you are independent and you can be a watchdog, but you can also intervene, you can train, you can coach, you can advocate and you can monitor. This is excellent. anything to create change for the better. Yeah. Thank you. It brings me very naturally to Professor Reverend Asante. Um, as uh, you, you are in a context, I think what was interesting to hear from Nana Cruza is that Really, no society is immune in front of hate speech uh, and in front of basically what could lead to atrocities. And in turn, in your context, you have other kinds of, of issue which may be relevant in this context. In this conjuncture now, you have also several elections coming in um, in West Africa. And it would be very interesting for us to hear what your Peace Council has been doing uh, to prevent uh, violence related to election. But I think it would be also very interesting, given also what Nana said before, um, and that you are very involved in the church. Uh, what, what is the contribution of the spiritual leaders in your context in raising awareness and education on human rights towards a culture of peace. Can you share also in this context some lessons learned and, and good practices in this regard? Thank you, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much. Um, I am the, as you rightly said, the former chairman of the National Peace Council, actually the outgoing, because the, the new chairman is yet to be elected. Now the National Peace Council is, um, was brought into being by an act of parliament, Act 818. And therefore, it is a national 
institution. The objective of the National Peace Council is to facilitate and develop mechanisms for conflict prevention, management, and resolution of conflict, and to build sustainable peace in the country. That's the main objective. Now, to fulfill this objective, there are what I will call five main areas that the National Peace Council is engaged in. The first is to coordinate, that is harmonize and coordinate conflict prevention, management resolution, because we believe that there are a number of um, organizations, civil society organizations that are in our country that are committed to ensuring peace. And we have the responsibility to coordinate, to bring them together so that we can um, operate with one voice in addressing the issues of um, that call for peace and resolution of conflict. So there is the coordination dimension, the harmonization of efforts that have been made to facilitate peace. The second is what I call capacity building. It is to strengthen capacity for conflict prevention. In Ghana, we have traditional leaders, chiefs and queen mothers, and some leaders in different places who have a role to play in terms of the maintenance of peace in the country. Now, we have the responsibility to build their capacity by helping them give training them, giving them the expertise to be able to do what they need to do. That's not to say that before the Peace Council, they, they, they were not acting. I mean, the, the chiefs and others in their villages, in their localities, have been able to maintain the people. But it is also to let them know that we are moving into, you know, I mean, with a new um, society that we are, where people are moving from one place to another, they need their capacities to be built to be able to address the issues of conflict. Conflicts are bound to come. For us, our, our belief is that you cannot avoid conflict. Once you have different ethnic groupings, in Ghana, you have different ethnic groupings with different languages and people belonging to different religions. It is not, it's not a mono religious country. You have Christians, you have Muslims, you have traditional religionists that we have different people. So there is bound to be conflict. But how do we manage it in such a way that it doesn't become violent conflict? How do we manage it in such a way that you live and let others live? So we build capacity. We also educate the public. And that means that we have to cooperate with other institutions, government institutions and other um, institutions that are in place to also educate people. For example, the National Commi Commission on Civic Education, we work hand in hand with them because they are responsible in terms of educating the public to know their rights and to know what they need to do when they are in trouble, where to go and all that. And we work hand in hand with them. We also have the responsibility to facilitate amicable re resolution and also to promote understanding of the values of diversity, uh, trust and tolerance. Because in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in our, in our setup, we need that value of diversity, that value of trust, that value of tolerance. And, and so we are into education, we are into building capacity so that others will be able to do something. We are into coordinating and harmonizing what needs to be done. Now, what have we, where are the people drawn from? I've already said that it's a national institution. The, the, the National Peace Council has a governing board at the national level, at the regional level, and also at the district level. At the national level, you have representatives from the various institutions religious institutions, 
You know, Ghana is highly religious. About 90% of Ghanaians claim to belong to one religion or the other. Christians claim to be about 70%. And therefore, you cannot do anything in this country and ignore the religious group. So what we have sought to do at the national level, the National Peace Council is governed by a 13 member board council, a 13 member board that takes care of the council. And who are these people? They are drawn from the Catholic Bishop Conference and from the Christian Council. When I say the Christian Council, the Christian Council mainly um, has to do with um, Protestant institutions like my church, the Methodist, the Presbyterian Church, the Anglican Church, and some other mainline churches in the country. And then, of course, you also have another Christian group, the Ghana Pentecostal Council. These are the Pentecostals who also have a council. And then, of course, we also have National Council of Christian and Charismatic Churches. The Pentecostals are different. Charismatics are different. They also have their council. And each of these groupings nominates one person, you know, to vote to be. To be to become members of the National Peace Council. Then when it comes to the Muslims, you have the Ahmadiyya Muslim Mission. They also bring one person. You have the Al Sunnah Muslims, and then you have what you call the Ijamiya Muslims. And you know, when people hear of Islam, we normally think that when you talk about Islam, you are talking about just one group. There are different groups, and all of them are sitting in the and then, of course, practitioners of African traditional religion also bring us representatives. And then two persons nominated by the president of the republic, one of whom should be a woman. And then representatives of the National House of Peace. And then, from time to time, a recognized um, body, let's say women's lawyers or men's association in some places, we may ask them to bring one person to form the 13. This same methodology is applied at the regional level and also at the, at the um, at district level. So we have the National Peace Council, we have the Regional Peace Council, and we also have the District uh, Peace Council. They serve for a period of four years, it can be renewed um it's there's no limit to it i serve for a period of two terms i have served for almost eight years nine years i felt that um i need to step down for other people to come in when my term ended because i wasn't prepared to come again and i was nominated to serve on that council by the christian council at that time i happened to be the chairman of the of the Christian Council. So my first term, it was the Christian Council that nominated me. My second term, I was nominated by the President of the Republic um, because after I had finished, Christian Council nominated somebody and the President of the Republic nominated me to continue to serve on that. How is the chairman um, elected? The 13 member board, and that's so at the regional and also at the district level, will meet and when they meet they elect one of them to be their chair and they present that person to the president and the president appoints that person so it is not the president who appoints so to speak picks somebody and say i want this person to be the chair it is the group that meets and then they will nominate one of their members they will elect one of their members and present that person to the president, and then the president appoints that person to be the chair. So on the two terms that I served as the, as the chair, it was the group that appointed me, and the president, you know, uh, the group that elected me, and the president appointed me to serve as the chair. Now, what have we done in respect of election? I remember 
Um, we came into office in the year 2011. Just around the corner, 2012, we were going to have election. And it was very, very, you know, election in our part of, this, of the world can be very, 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 very fancy. And so we needed to do something about it. What did we do? We brought all the political parties and the presidential candidates together. We worked with Manchiade Asante Hene and with the UNDP and with other institutions. And we brought all the political parties, the, the, the flag bearers together to commit themselves to peace and to say that after the election, they will be prepared to accept the outcome of the election without fighting. And if there is a need for them to raise issues, they will use the law courts instead of taking to arms um, and to violent um, clashes, clashes to solve their problem. And it succeeded. We have had seven elections, parliamentary and presidential elections in this country. Governments have changed, you know, uh, opposition parties have become have taken over, others have come over. Even though we have a number of political parties in, in, in the country, Ghana tends to be a duopoly. It's, it's, it's a contest always between the NDC and the NPP. Come 7 December, we will have another election. And, 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 and so, I mean, we're going to have another election on the 7th of December. Right now, the political parties are campaigning and our responsibility is to ensure that the campaign without, you know, the campaign is done in a peaceful way that they don't engage in acts that will create violent clashes. Already, when we were doing voters registration in some places, there were pockets of violent clashes, and we had to move in there to try and talk to the people and get the people to sign a call to say that, listen, if there's this disturbance, if we disagree, we will rather use the law courts instead of using our fists and gadgets and other things to fight and all that. The, there is a, a phenomenon in Ghana which we call vigilantism. The vigilantism, it's um, a group of people who bind themselves together. These are you know, tough guys who are usually um, um, mobilized by the various political parties and, 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 and the MPs to go with them in their campaigns and they go there to question people. We, you know, in the past, they had been creating problems in different places, stealing, you know, taking ballot boxes and, and so on. But we have been able to meet with the major political parties. And they have come into agreement not to have anything to do with them. Parliament has also come up with law that outlaws vigilantism. And our responsibility now in respect of this election is going around to various constituencies and educating the parties and the stakeholders, especially the young people who are always mobilized to do these things. Thank, thank you, Reverend Asente. I think it's very impressive uh, what you are what you are telling us. Not only uh, you are reflecting on a on a very holistic approach that your Peace Council has uh, in Ghana, but you have also huge moral authority based on your autonomy and independence. I think that's a very important message also to our audience that we heard also from Nana Cruza before, independence, autonomy are key. And you are adding uh, this these, um, value-based message uh, that you are embodying through, um, through the Peace Council, but also through uh, your role as spiritual leader. And another dimension that you could explain very well was this multi-track, as we say in our jargon, but the capacity that you have to act at village level, at regional level, and national level. 
and you speak face to face also to the president. So I think it's extremely important. I would add that you have been reflecting also on, on the role nearly as a kind of national mediator and facilitator, um, notably in, in conflict resolution. And I, I suppose we can come back to that um, once we have listened to everyone. I may recall to our audience, uh, use the chat if you want to ask us questions, tell us where you are listening to us. It's wonderful to, to know about you. So you say, I'm, um, I'm in Congo. I have seen someone in Congo. I've seen someone in, in Bosnia. So it's very nice to, to hear about that. Um, uh, Reverend Asante, thank you very much. I I'm, I'm apologize that I kind of interrupted you, but uh, I want to leave space also for the others and in particular for the conversation. Um, thank you, thank you very much. I may pass now and fasten your seatbelt. We go to Costa Rica. Um, and um, um, Victor, I, I'm, I'm very pleased you are here um for your broad history also and maybe maybe begin um because you have been working in uh in the inter-american commission on human rights so we have had now two examples of national entities uh and their role in the promotion and the protection of human rights and also the resolution of cases so um but again, in the same line, could you share the main lessons learned and, and good practices regarding the very famous, by the way, uh, Inter-American Commission on Human Rights? And because of your specialities, you have this deep knowledge about torture. So it's all about reparation also and the accompaniment on a legal basis, but also um, more broadly, and including also the prevention of discrimination based on gender and sexual orientation. The floor is yours, Victor. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mo. And I'm looking at you to make sure that you can hear me well. Thank you very much. It's um, extremely uh, important and a great honor for me to be invited to this panel. I want to acknowledge the importance of coalition thinking in the prevention of mass atrocities. And I really want to commend the existence of this state and also non-state coalition to ensure that we prevent as much as is humanly possible the um, perpetration of mass atrocities, the likes of which, of course, we continue to see in our lifetime and I'm therefore delighted to be able to contribute a small grain of sand in this colossal endeavor that you've set for yourselves. And of course, very honored to be here with Nana and Reverend Asante and Savita and you uh, as well, Mo. Really delighted to be here. Now, as you say, I have the privilege of having been placed in many settings where mass atrocity and perpetration of human rights violations is very much what the body was uh, having to do. I, I have been at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in charge of um, portfolios concerning massacres and mass violations of the 80s in Latin America, and then uh, in the Inter-American Commission, dealing as well with phenomena of state-perpetrated uh, atrocities, um, torture-related issues, and as well uh, now in my capacity as independent expert, on protection from violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. What I would like to share with you at the outset is the importance of analyzing prevention from an interdisciplinary approach. There is a fundamental uh, methodological need to ensure that we understand atrocities as a phenomenon that needs to be studied deconstructed and tackled from the understanding that it is a complex phenomenon and that it is really only through an anthropological, sociological, sometimes psychological, and of course, legal and political lens. Also, uh, some other aspects such as economical realities and interconnectedness that we can really tackle the phenomenon of mass atrocity and systemic perpetration of human rights violations. And I have, Mo, in my experience, developed the theory 
that mass perpetration, uh, mass atrocity, and in fact, systemic violations of human rights all uh, are carried out taking as enabling factor a series of triggers and mechanisms that in fact look very similar in all cases. And in this, I am also able to analyze and perhaps bring a little bit to the table the experience of the Inter-American Commission, but also some special procedures of the United Nations. And allow me to borrow on the expression of the former special rapporteur on uh, torture, Juan Mendes, when he identified otherness and what he called in Spanish the equivalent as otherization as the fundamental mechanism enabling mass atrocities and perpetration of torture and other human rights violations. And what I mean by this is that there is a very explicit and well honed mechanism that allows perpetration of atrocities and human rights violations, which is the idea that that person that is the victim to whom one is actually violating the rights belongs to some sort of a category that makes them an other. And this can operate, of course, in the realm of political thinking. The others may be people that are on the other end of the scope and are threatening our way of life. It may be in the scope of uh, race. It may be in the scope of ethical origins. And in my current field of work, it actually is perpetrated and enabled through stigma that is facilitated through mechanisms of establishing people belonging to sexual diversity and gender diversity as others. And I will use this Mo as an example to draw on how this theory works. There are fundamentally three mechanisms that enable discrimination and violence against LGTB persons. They are demonization, pathologization, and criminalization. Somehow the drivers establish the idea that LGTB lives are somehow sinful or ill or antisocial. And as a consequence of the driving of all of these institutional societal drivers, we have seen a world that over the last, you know, the beginning of the last century, heavily criminalized LGTB lives. As of today, the remnants of that process make it so that 69 countries still maintain criminalization. A staggering 2 billion people live in criminalized environments in relation to sexual orientation and gender identity. Other drivers are pathologization. As you know, since the beginning of psychoanalysis and the medical science of psychiatry, homosexuality, lesbianism, and trans lives were somehow defined as mentally ill. And therefore, the World Health Organization, for the longest time, maintained homosexuality as a mental disorder. And only until last year, trans, trans uh, gender identity was considered to be a mental illness. The third driver, of course, being demonization, the idea that LGTB lives are somehow sinful, and in very many ways of political and social discourse, connected to deviant forms of sexuality, such as pedophilia, for example. I use this as an example because this is a fundamental mechanism of otherization. By establishing these lives as antisocial, as disordered, as somehow uh, criminal, discrimination and violence are legitimized and in a way enabled. And indeed, violence and discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity exist in all corners of the world. And reviews have shown that lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and gender non-conforming persons are at heightened risk of physical and sexual violence. In most cases, it is sexual orientation and gender identity that play a key role in the perpetration of the abuse. 
Now, I remain deeply concerned by information of killings of lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and gender nonconforming persons, or even those that are perceived as such by their attackers. Where trustworthy data exist, and more, I want to underline that those are very few contexts, the resulting picture is shocking, and it includes killings committing, committed on the basis of gender identity and gender expression, the imposition of death penalty for homosexuality, killings in private homes and public spaces known as social cleansing, and so-called honor killings. In reality, the acts of violence are perpetrated in many cases by state agent pursuant to legislation or regulations connected with criminalization. Some cases appear to be isolated episodes of hate motivated violence and others seem to be organized and planned as part of systemic policies or patterns aimed at targeting the victims. I am on the record as having expressed serious concern of allegations of unlawful detention, torture, ill treatment and extrajudicial of individuals in Chechnya, for example. Although, unfortunately, I never received a substantive reply from the Russian Federation in that respect. Now, we also know that forced anal examinations are actually common practice in a certain part of the world, well documented in 12 countries, as well as campaigns um, promoting, in a way, hate crimes in relation to sexual orientation and gender identity. And hate crimes, which may be qualified as biphobic, homophobic, misogynistic, or transphobic, or in line with other biases, ma are manifest in every region of the world. Nana's uh, presentation uh, was clear in relation to that. The difference being that in certain contexts, state authority are mindful enough to actually document them and try to tackle them, whereas in other parts of the world, negation is the official state policy. Um, of course, making the problem worse. This is happening in all regions of the world. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the Inter-American Commission and Court of Human Rights and the African Commission on Human and People's Rights all have concurred in the identification and condemnation of heinous acts, which include dismembering, mutilation, stoning, decapitation, burning, or impalement. And again, uh, Mo, what I wanted to just make sure that I come back to is what this heinous way of perpetrating violence reveals is the idea that the persons to whom this violence is perpetrator it is, they are not quite human in the view of the perpetrate, of the perpetrating agent. And I would, I would su submit the working theory that this is an enabling mechanism of mass atrocities usually and everywhere. That the idea of othering, of creating the notion that the people that are the victims of this perpetration are not quite as belonging to the same nature as quote unquote us, is the fundamental enabling mechanism of violence and uh, discrimination of this extent and of this intensity, if you will. In reality, the unique features of hate-motivated crimes must be analyzed in the context of broader pro power structures, deeply entrenched gender inequality and rigid sexual and gender norms. Violence based in my in my in the case of my mandate on sexual orientation and gender identity is really only a way to regain control and to excise punishment for resisting or transgressing gender norms of behaviors. And this is applicable more all across the board. I had in my previous incarnation, I was working a lot in the Horn of Africa in relation to gender-based perpetrated torture against women who had ascertained their property rights, for example. And rape was the most common mechanism to the level where it was systemic, and I would uh, argue a mass uh, perpetration of rape, to ensure that women would be intimidated not to exercise their property rights, particularly in the case of inheritance and in the face of uh, 
male family members, something that in certain parts of uh, the Horn of Africa actually has achieved endemic proportions. Now, I know I'm, I'm reached or I have reached the end of my time, so I'm actually going to leave you with uh, just two more sentences. First, the role of regional and special procedures mechanisms in relation to this type of dynamics, I would argue, is the same. We are supposed to be early warners because we see the situation on the ground because we have contact with people that are actually informing us of specific cases. And therefore, we can function, as has been the expression before, as the eyes and ears of the Human Rights Council or in the case of the regional bodies of the political bodies to which they are appended. Now, I have to say, in my experience, sometimes state structures are quite keen to close their ears and, and blindfold their eyes. So it is also important that we have a vigorous and robust voice that is independent and impartial, and that we are able to use also our um, public voice sometimes to make sure that certain issues are brought to the public arena. And on this, I think that maintaining a vigorous, robust regional and global uh, mechanism presence is a fundamental way to ensure human rights um, furtherance all over the world. And my final word, of course, for the interconnectedness of all of these mechanisms, including, of course, the enormous importance of commissions such as the one described by Reverend Asante and of national human rights institutions. And we're about to hear of Savita of another, yet another angle. So just to uh, ensure that we acknowledge the interconnectedness of all of this effort, the interdisciplinary nature of effort that are required. And of course, again, I close how I started acknowledging the importance, the enormous importance of the coalition thinking that you are putting in place to ensure that this work goes forward. I am thrilled to, to be here and very much look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Paul. Gracias, Victor. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you really uh, very much. Um, you recall us, and, and we have heard that from, from Nana and, and Reverend Asante, that um, it's always about creating another mm -hmm. uh, in, in many different forums. What Nana was telling, huh? uh, what uh, Reverend Asante was telling, now it goes so far that it can go to this commission of atrocities that you have been describing. Uh, and we should remain very aware of that. We are not just talking about events that hurt a person in a bus by uh, being violent uh, in, in speaking towards her or against her, potentially it has the capacity to go so far that this person may be uh, tortured, may be killed in the name of this person not being a human equal to me. And in that, we are all on an equal footage. And uh, when you spoke about this interconnectedness, it can only come into my mind, Victor, that basically the market is so-called globalized, right? So we need also to be globalized in, in these values. We need to be globalized in the defense of these human rights and in the defense of equality of human rights uh, all over. What, what I like and what I find striking as, as far as these uh, three speakers is that we really understand through your example that no society is immune but actually prevention is tangible, prevention is visible, and there are a lot of actions actually uh, that can be done. Uh, and, and we will come back to this, but I think it's very important. So many people are telling us, you know, prevention is not measured because something didn't happen. But actually you have been sharing with us narratives which makes it very tangible and it makes a joint narrative for uh, prevention in action. So. Thank you very much. The otherization, as you say, um, and our friend Juan Mendez uh, did it very well. And also the pluridisciplinarity. Uh, this is a language to my ears. I'm, a, I'm an anthropologist, so working a lot uh, with legal actors and we have Reverenda Sante, Nana Cruza. And yes, if we succeed in bringing our joint knowledge and creating value-based coalitions, 
and uh, with principle and a capacity of action in the public sphere, as you were saying, and also capacity to train public servants and institutions, um, I think we can actually move this train of action. And it leads me to my uh, good friend, Savita, uh, that I admire so much. And, and Savita, you are playing a very, very key role since so much time to set up um, national and regional and international mechanism. So I would, what, what we were hearing also from me, Ghana, from me, Denmark, uh, what Victor was telling are as many examples of protection in action. Mm? So what are now the, the main lessons learned and, and good practices that you want to share with us in, in this capacity of states with the support of their society to protect their own people and to make them be seen all as human in the same society. You have the floor, Savita. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mo. And um, I would like to, um, I'm, I'm extremely honored to be part of such an eminent panel of experts and, and fabulous speakers. So uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And of course, we are the co-hosts, so that's, that's a privilege too. But uh, I mean, it's fantastic that the way we have um, lined up the presentation that we speak to each other um, in, in a particular way. And um, all of you have pointed out ways in which promotion of human rights, uh, protection from hate crimes, LGBTQ and you know, mitigation of violence in, in Ghana, um, uh, election-based violence, um, brings me to the presentation which I am going to talk about is basically how Geneva-based human rights mechanisms um, can, have been useful in promoting human rights and thus preventing atrocities. And I would like to begin by sort of making that connection, which Mo uh, did make in her earlier presentation, um, that you know, Global Center right now monitors around 25 countries around the world. And in most of these cases, the causes, the context, and the consequences are different. But in most of these uh, uh, contexts, what is a, 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 a common note is the fact that it, in many cases, this is preceded by months and years and sometimes decades of patterns of serious human rights violations. From Myanmar to Sri Lanka to Burundi to Central African Republic, Sahel, Syria, China, um, all of these countries where atrocities are ongoing or populations are at risk, um, we have seen systematic abuses of universal human rights um, that have been ongoing. And for this reason, um, it is the, it's seen that a rise in human rights violations and abuses or historic patterns of such abuses are considered an important risk factor and warning signs for mass atrocity crimes. To be clear, not all human rights crises necessarily result in the commission of atrocities, but in many circumstances, patterns of violations can indicate, among others, that a society is particularly vulnerable in the commission of atrocity crime. So this relationship um, is extremely crucial in highlighting the role that Geneva-based human rights mechanisms can play in the mitigation of mass atrocity crimes. And here I'll outline four ways in which um, Geneva mechanisms can highlight national capacities to promote human rights and prevent atrocities. So the first one is universal periodic review, UPR. So UPR provides a unique opportunity for mainstreaming and institutionalizing prevention of mass atrocity crimes um, by encouraging states to assess as well as strengthen their national capacity. It not only mobilizes national actors and resources, but also international support to a country under review through technical assistance and capacity building. And my organization urges countries under review, as well as countries that are asking questions and providing recommendations to incorporate an atrocity angle into their contributions to the UPR process in order to highlight potential risk and assist in building national capacity to prevent atrocities. So for example, UPR recommendations aimed at strengthening uh, legislative and institutional frameworks to guarantee principles of non-discrimination, ensuring the presence of various communities in political and public office, investigating all cases of discriminatory behavior or dangerous public discourse, can go a long way in building resilience within societies, as both Nana as well as Victor and Professor Asante spoke about. 
The same applies to laws and practices and institutions aimed at preventing sexual violence or eliminating discriminatory practices related to dis uh, reproduction, and both of which may constitute war crimes or crimes against humanity if taken to an extreme level. So that's one. Second is special, special procedures, and Victor, you talked about it, and in the atrocity community, as you said, we look at special procedures and, and special rapporteurs as early warning uh, um, mechanisms. You are the eyes and the ears. But at the same time, special rapporteurs also are a key component of building capacity at the national level. So you not only raise alarm, but what you do is that by your visits uh, to different countries and you're looking at distinct thematic areas so including freedom of expression torture truth and justice or human rights defenders special procedures form a vital part in understanding both root causes or potential atrocity crimes and outlining areas for necessary reform and this is important to note this is not only for countries at risk but also countries that do not that that there doesn't exist an imminent risk in the, these countries so I would like to say that states should invite special rapporteurs, welcome their visits, because special mandate holders and special rapporteurs can then provide recommendations to address certain areas, which can then stop further escalation. Third, Third is the human rights system, and that plays an important role um, through um, the technical assistance and capacity building. The so-called item 10 of the Human Rights Council is extremely crucial. I mean, it provides assistance and capacity building and understanding of how to uh, prevent through various methods. And it's especially crucial for countries that are just coming out of atrocities from DRC to um, to many other countries um, who require this assistance, not only in the context of how to build national institutions which prevent, but also, also to monitor and report and to sort of provide early warning in case situations start deter uh, deteriorating. So that's the third. And the final, I would say, is a much more sort of a coercive tool, but extremely important, which is the investigative mechanisms. So commission of inquiries or fact-finding missions um, and other investigative body, which focus on monitoring, investigating, and establishing the facts of circumstances of grave abuses and violations of international human rights and atrocity um, crimes. And um, such mechanisms collect evidence, map existing patterns of violations, uh, sometimes they identify perpetrators, but their instrumental role is in establishing an accurate and an unbiased historical record. And this is extremely important, especially for um, survivors and communities for reconciliation. And all the investigative mechanisms are not mandated uh, to uh, initiate criminal um, prosecutions. They may serve as an important deterrent and inhibit the potential commission of further atrocities. The public release of these reports by investigative uh, reports um, of the investigative uh, mechanisms also puts potential perpetrators on notice that their violations will be subject to international scrutiny. And while accountability to the truth has a fundamental impact on dealing with the past, bringing perpetrators help, helps enable um, reconciliation. Uh, the public discourse of findings of these mechanisms can therefore contribute to the to potential political change sometimes, including institutional reform and capacity building that strengthen domestic efforts at preventing recurrence of conflict or atrocities. So by directly applying the atrocity prevention lens, investigative mechanisms can broaden our understanding of patterns of behaviors that enable commission of atrocities. So in the case of COI on Burundi, as well as the FFN on Myanmar, um, they both uh, utilize the UN framework of analysis on atrocity crimes. And this deepened their understanding of root causes and, and, and consequences of these root causes on the condition of human rights, and which then led to the commission of atrocities. So all of these mechanisms are really important in enhancing um, human rights protections and thus preventing atrocities in the future. But one must also acknowledge the challenges here. And those challenges are that um, the inclusion of the atrocity prevention lens, the inclusion of understanding that human rights violations le may lead to atrocity crimes should also come with the understanding that that is the first step. What we need with UPR is 
follow up is the implementation of the recommendations. Even with technical assistance that is provided, what we need is a better implementation of the technical assistance and national capacity building um, processes. And finally, Geneva mechanisms, and Victor, you pointed this out before, they monitor, assess, and produce reports and findings that are granular as well as structural to provide member, uh, member states with enough information and justification for action. But to maximize their political um, potential and impact, the distance between Geneva and New York uh, has to be bridged. And the gap between human rights and conflict prevention has to be bridged. The reporting obligation of investigative mechanisms, special rapporteurs, and even the High Commissioner for Human Rights need to be expanded to include other UN bodies and the UN Security Council. Um, just not one part of the system or one mechanism can, can prevent. As Victor, you outlined, it's about a creating a coalition. And that's what we do at Gamma. It's not about just one actor. It's many actors coming together. But all those actors need to be aware of what the risks are, how, what is the dynamic of atrocity crimes. And I feel that there's still so much understanding that needs to happen for us to be able to do so. And with the work that civil society organizations do, with the work that national institutions are doing, the work that is happening in Geneva, with all of these different um, mechanisms, there is an incredibly rich uh, basis of knowledge, of understanding of practice, but we are not taking advantage of it. So I hope that uh, through conversations like this and through a, a platform like Gamma, we are able to share best practices and, and move forward from there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Savita, for your very passionate call, call for knowing what is out there and that can help us. And uh, there are multiple mechanisms. And actually, we could say, and you said it often, that during the last decades, we have seen an incremental celebration of human rights. Um, but now we have to have an incremental celebration of implementation. Huh? And this is really, uh, really our task. Now, uh, we have received many, many questions. And it would be uh, frustrating for our community, who is from all over the world, and who are asking questions of all kinds. So let me as a facilitator come back to our panelists and, and suggest the following. Um, I think that um, I would very much like you to, to speak to our audience and to say, these are my three top recommendations to make human rights-based prevention a reality at national level, at regional level, at uh, international level in a multilateral arena. I think this would be very helpful. This is what I kind of take off the questions that are coming, what can we do and how can we act? I think we have heard from Nana and, and Reverend Asante that it's possible to act at national level. And it's possible to act while making the connections with the multilateral arena and using all these tools. So you are showing us an example. Uh, so maybe I would begin with you. What are your top three recommendations to our audience? And I would also like you to, to say something about your youth. This is the new generation coming in. Uh, they should be involved in that. And how can we make with them also prevention a, a reality? So Nana Cruza and Reverend Asente, and then we will have another round with, uh, with Victor and, and Savita uh, on this. And think about the audience, they are in very concrete situations. Uh, they want to know more. I think you have good example there to share. So what are your top three, top five recommendations to each of them? Nana. Yeah, can you hear me? Perfect, yes. Um, okay, I'll think in order to also do it uh, brief, I think one of my top recommendations is focus. Like, again, I go back to the whole pit bull uh, or the bulldog image because it's easy to just, you know, focus on an area for like a year or half a year or two. But the fact that this combating hate crimes, it's, it's so important that you have to keep focusing on it. You have to be at it all the time. So you can't say this is our strategy for the next two years. No, this has to be our strategy forever, I want to say. So focus, focus, focus. Don't let it go. It's too important. Another um, recommendation I would say is dialogue. 
like dialogue with both uh, government authorities, even though when you disagree with them, you don't think they do enough, they're not on the case, you have to keep the dialogue with them. Keep inviting them, keep knocking on their door saying, we have to change this. It's your responsibility, you can do it. And also dialogue, I think with civil society is important um, to actually be their voice when they can't be a voice. Um, to be able again to perhaps bridge the gap between civil society and authorities and especially also the police uh, who I think in this area uh, plays a, a, a rather vital role. Um, so I think focus and dialogue and um, keeping also dialogue with the with civil um, society is extremely important but I could go on and on and on. <laughs> Uh, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Reverend Asente, your top three important priorities for our audience, for action. Well, I think that you cannot talk about peace without talking about justice. And therefore, it is important that um, issues of justice become prime importance of any approach to peace. What is it that is creating that condition that is disturbing the peace? Justice. I mean, if you're talking about young people, unemployment is an issue. Um, I have always said that unemployment is a security issue. And our young people must be helped in other words, the educational system, and I'm speaking from our perspective, from the African perspective, must help the young people to come up, not to complete education and look up to the government for employment, but they should be given the capacity to be able to start their own thing. The question of justice is crucial. Tolerance is another issue. We need to tolerate. We all of us cannot think alike. We cannot behave alike. We cannot do things alike. In other words, tolerance will accept difference. And I think it is important for us to know that that is the reality we live with. We cannot mean, it's not going to be possible that all of us will think in the same way, will hold the same value, and so on. And therefore, let us learn to tolerate to listen to other people, to try to understand what has caused them to behave the way they behave, instead of simply throwing them, you know, and ignoring them. Tolerance is very, very important. My third point is that by all means, take non-violent approach to solving your situations of difference. Non-violent approach. He's already talked about dialogue. Let's dialogue. Let's talk. I call it, let's jaw jaw. Let's sit and talk. Listen to me. Let me listen to you. Let us find a common solution to that. So for me, the question of justice, the question of toleration, and the question of nonviolence um, will bring about the social cohesion that we need. Professor Asante, uh, th thank you very much. You have given us, Nana and, 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 and you, Reverend Asante, I, I think what could be the culture, the elements of what is the culture of prevention, actually. I, I will come back to that. But I would like to turn to, to, to Victor and, and Savita. Give us also your, your three main concrete, simple, doable, feasible recommendations for early victories. Victor. Thank you, Mo. Um, so I'll share with you, I just finalized and I will be presenting to the General Assembly my report on COVID-19 response and recovery free from discrimination and violence. And in the context of that report, I had a conversation with over a thousand persons coming from a hundred countries. And we assembled what I think is a set of recommendations uh, that may be applicable, I think, to prevention of the type of atrocities that you were talking about. So I'll share that with you very quickly. 
is called the Aspire framework. And Aspire is a mnemonic device that actually makes reference to six principles. Acknowledge diversity as a fundamental component. So always ask yourself when you're at a meeting, who was left out? Who is not here? Whose rights are being talked about? And whose rights might be an issue that is not here? Support organizations led and serving minorities. In my case, of course, sexual diversity and gender identity, but I think that applicable to others. Protect people from violence and discrimination. Ensure that indirect discrimination is assessed. Seemingly neutral provisions very often have impact that is detrimental in certain parts of the population. So keep your indirect discrimination at bay, at check. Representation is key. You need to ensure that people are on the table where the solutions are being designed and where monitoring and evaluation takes place. In your case, where preventing preventive measures are being designed. And fi finally, and most importantly in this era, evidence-based approaches are fundamental. We need to act free from prejudice and preconception and act based on evidence. And only if we act based on evidence, we will have public policy, legal and access to justice response that are really tailored to the reality. So my recommendation is one is aspire, understanding this as the framework. Thank you, Mo. Wonderful, Victor. Wonderful, Victor. We will circulate your reports uh, for our audience also, so stay tuned. I think uh, these are also important elements. Savita, your main three recommendations to share with our audience. I don't know whether there are three recommendations or not, but one of the primary recommendations I would say, and I've been talking about it in many different platforms, is that across the world right now, I mean, this is a global phenomena, we have seen an incredible rise of hate speech. And my appeal to the audiences of this um, uh, panel is that stop othering, um, stop indulging in hate speech and wherever possible, um, combat hate speech, as Victor said, with an evidence-based uh, argument. Uh, and, and that is all that we can do as, as people of, uh, you know, of people of this world, or people of the same humanity. And then at a, a more higher level, I would say, and I would not be a civil society representative if I did not hold governments to uh, account. I mean, prevention is a political process. You have to commit to prevention. And my um, message to, to governments is that you need to uh, do a better job on this. You need to do a better job in upholding your um, responsibility towards a promotion of human rights and stop demonizing communities. And this is not a case you know, in one single country, or it, it's the case in Syria or in Central African Republic. It's the case in the US right now, in India right now, in Hungary right now, and everywhere in the world. So I think that that's what we need to commit to, a political process, which is inclusive, which is representative, which is justice oriented, and which uh, abides by human rights principles. And we need to stop othering and, and be part of either the hate speech um, uh, system uh, or you know, we need to combat it. That's what I would say. Thank you, Savita. This is absolutely brilliant. I, I would like to, to try to wrap up and then I will give you a, a last word. I, I strongly believe that what you have been saying is um, also crucial because in this period of COVID, it has, it, the pandemic has had an effect of revelator, I think on the most important weaknesses of our society. And at the same time, what you are saying and what you are describing from the work you do and Aspire and your recommendation, Savita, tells me that prevention is adding quality to our democracies. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we can make it explicit and we can measure it and we can make it actually tangible and, uh, and valuable. So uh, our lovely bulldog has told us that we need to focus, actually, we need to be persistent. Uh, and we need to focus because hate speech, the otherization as we have been using it uh, several times is a long-term strategy to be inclusive and to embrace uh, the other as part of our diverse community as a long-term endeavor. 
and it's multifacetic, it's multidimensional, and it uh, goes through education and through um, very many different um, angles. And in that, you are also saying we need to dialogue. Dialogue, and Professor Reveranta Sante was also saying the same. Dialogue is key, dialogue with the other, dialogue with the one that uh, thinks differently. And dialogue also to make state institution, and in particular, uh, security institutions such as the police. In other contexts, you also have the army who, who is playing this role, um, are playing a very important role in this proximity and in this is respect of the rights of everyone. Um, peace and justice are there. Um, basically, you are all saying that acknowledging and taking responsibility are two pillars of a virtuous uh, dynamic. Uh, acknowledging the facts and taking responsibility to deal with them are extremely important, and we need states for that to, to engage. And But to advance, we can only celebrate difference and diversity and make massive trainings uh, in um, nonviolent capacity to manage conflicts, right? Nonviolence is key in that, but it's also the capacity to name the conflict existing and to work on them in the public sphere and not to have to hide and to um, have this un under the carpet. So the, the listening, the understanding, all these are qualities which are important to understand what is at stake actually um, when this happens. It tells me also, Reverend Asante, that in your call for a massive, I would say, strengthening of capacities of nonviolent management of conflict, this requires also from the prevention community also to invest in capacity, in training, and also in, in mediation at, at all level, I would say, in capacity to, to transform. Um, Victor, you have been talking to us about the Aspire framework, and I would not be faithful to all the points you said, but basically they are also there. And uh, one of the bases is the acknowledgement of diversity you know, uh, in all its forms. And uh, the acknowledgement and, and legal framework for that, security and protection, and also um, the evidence-based approach, which is absolutely crucial. Um, to dismantle uh, prejudices and um, and um, yeah prejudices that may have us treat anyone and Nana, we didn't speak about disabled people enough. I think uh, this is a massive um, important point, um, and um, this is uh, extremely important. And Savita, you are making us a call to embrace the other as part of our own society, as part of um, now, we have been seeing what can be done there at national level, I would say, and uh, we still have a few minutes for one recommendation. I think that what you said, Savita, about the possibility to really mainstream a human rights-based approach in the multilateral arena, and I'm thinking in particular about the Human Rights Council, which plays such an important role. So is there anything you want also to share his, with our colleagues? We have many colleagues uh, working in, in missions in Geneva. Uh, what can we do to help our high commissioner in her endeavor? And what can we do to strengthen the capacity of the Human Rights Council to, um, to be one most important piece of, of prevention? Very short, very precise. Very doable, Savita. Uh, thank you, Mo. I mean, I would just echo the same things which Professor Asante said and Victor said, and you also have said, that we need to listen better. I think that the strategies and sometimes the policies and programs that we implement are not necessarily uh, what people on the ground want or need. I mean, this is a very bottoms up approach, I mean, very top down approach, especially in the multilateral arena. Um, we need to talk to people like uh, Nana who are working every day, looking at that one case at a time. And, and that's what we need to do. We need to listen better, uh, understand the ground realities and tailor the approaches um, that are representative of, of what the people need and they want and what will actually bring about change rather than imposing these cookie cutter ideas of what we think is needed. So I think just listen better, context matters. Uh, so that would be my advice to a multilateral audience. 
Thank you. Okay, tailor made context matters. So we need more Reverend Asante, we need Nana Cruza to come and share your experiences to show us what prevention on, on the ground is and what human rights based prevention on the ground is. And Victor, uh, as you are working and so in this in this context, uh, again, for you, one or two very, you would have Michelle Bachelet here, what would you recommend her? I think that fundamentally defending the independence and the robust nature of the framework in which special procedures work is uh, a must. We all know that uh, the system of special procedures is constantly under attack, I would say, uh, from different quarters that are not interested in their, in their particular work. So I think that defending that independence and that capacity to be that voice, those ear, those eyes, is a fundamental part of the work that not only the High Commissioner, uh, but also the whole system needs to do to ensure its useful purpose. Um, and again, because there is such interconnectedness in the work that we all do, what we need to understand is that we all rely on parts of a system for our work to be effective. So what we preach in relation to others, we also need to understand in relation to our own systems and institutionalities, states, national state, national human rights institutions, civil society, state structures, and then the regional and global machineries all work, I think, in a pretty well oiled manner to ensure that the signals are there. And then of course, if those that need to uh, kind of pick them up do so, I think we will bring the prevention work upward. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Um, next year in November, uh, GAMAC will hold its fourth meeting. It's, these are global meetings, very horizontal meetings. It will be on addressing hate speech, incitement and discrimination. We need uh, Nana Cruza to be there. We need Reverend Asante to be there. We need Victor Madrigal Borlos to be there. And of course, Savita, member of the steering group will be there. Um, we are already involved in preparing um, because we all had to somehow postpone so many things because we couldn't make it physically. So what we did is uh, in, in alliance and with the support of all the partner in this coalition, Victor, is to begin already working now so that next year we can come with tangible proposal recommendations. And so my message now, two minutes before we end, is to convene you all to take contact with, with GAMAC and through GAMAC to this platform. We'll give you space. Uh, there are many working groups now trying to work on how to address hate speech in different contexts, hate speech toward different groups, uh, to uh, promote also different kinds of constructive management of diversity, uh, to analyze this phenomenon of uh, otherization, also, uh, the manipulation of, of news, uh, et cetera. So you are more than welcome. That's a platform, it's open for everybody. We used to call it a big tent and in this big tent, we will serve you tea and welcome you and give you a space to call and to discuss with, with groups of people and we will put you in touch with people around the world. So I, I want to invite you uh, to, to be in touch with you, with us to stay tuned to contribute, we need urgently a real culture of prevention. So we need to understand what atrocities are, but we need to understand better from people like Nana Croza, like Vera, Reverend Asante, Victor and Savita, how we can now make this prevention in our everyday life, where we are, be it at multilateral level, or be it at national level or regional, very small step to have early victories and to say together, we are a community, we are together, and this is going to work because we do it together. So thank you very much. It has been a very, very uh, impressive uh, panel. I'm, I'm uh, honored and, and, and very pleased basically to have this chance to, to talk with you. Thank you very much. And to our audience, um, thank you for all your commentary, suggestion. I apologize uh, that we couldn't uh, answer to all your questions, but stay with us and work with us until next year so that your questions can be taken on board until um, the GAMAC 4 meeting. 
and uh, we can come out as a community stronger than today. So thank you very much and a big applause for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Goodbye so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. It was thank very you. good.